Are anti-monarchist scumbags for protesting while the King and Kate battle cancer? Plus... I think it's appropriate for me personally to see it. Um, I'm satisfied um, with the answers that she has given. Starmer passes the buck on Rayner's tax issue. This allegation's very serious for the Prime Minister. It's a very simple question, was she there or not? And if he was there, then his position's untenable. She's got form for calling for others to go. Will she resign if the police investigate her? Also, the Ministry of Justice refuses to let us pay to find out how many asylum seekers have committed sex offences. What are they hiding? And... It's Pride Month, and as a queer doctor, I love that we get to celebrate our LGBTQ plus patient. You will not believe the latest gender madness in the NHS. On my panel tonight is star columnist at The Telegraph, Alison Pearson, chairman of Global Britain, Aman Bagal, and ex-Labour advisor, Matthew Laza. Oh, and what happens next here? There we go. I will reveal all very, very shortly. Get ready, Britain. Here we go. The animals have taken over the zoo. Next. Patrick, thank you very much indeed, and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB newsroom tonight is that Michael Gove has described the management of Thames Water as a disgrace after calls to increase customers' bills to plug a major funding gap for the company. The firm's bosses are now admitting they could face the risk of emergency nationalisation as the cash crisis for the company deepens. Shareholders have refused to give the company half a billion pounds of extra funding, describing the rescue plan that was put in front of them as uninvestable. Instead, they want the regulator off what to increase customers' bills by up to 40% over the next five years. Levelling up as an idea, the sense that we need more regional equality um, is really important. But in order to make that work, you need a viable plan um, and you need to do the hard yards of implementing it. I'm afraid Boris Johnson didn't do that. Um, but I intend to make sure that um, every area, whether it's Dudley where we are now or anywhere across the country, feels the benefit of a growing economy. Well, that was Keir Starmer who was talking to GB News earlier on today and he was telling us that the levelling up agenda will be put back on track. Speaking shortly after an event that he went to in the West Midlands to launch his local Labour election campaign, he dismissed suggestions about a rumour that was going around that Boris Johnson may be given a role in reviving that policy. Now, in other news today, I can tell you that the government has been dismissing accusations that have been coming from the United Nations, who've called on Rishi Sunak to scrap their Rwanda scheme. The organisation's Human Rights Committee says the government's plan to send asylum seekers on a one-way ticket to the East African country should be abandoned or repealed if it comes back to Parliament. In the report, 18 member states raise concerns of discrimination and a potential violation of international law. Well, I can also tell you the government has pushed back today, accusing the UN of double standards itself because it already sends refugees to Rwanda. In news here at home, police have arrested a man in his 30s in connection with a double stabbing at a London tube station. It comes after another man was also arrested on suspicion of manslaughter following a stabbing in a different incident on a train, also in the capital. Footage shared on social media yesterday of that incident showed a masked man attacking another man with a large knife as passengers could be heard calling for help. Meanwhile, British Transport Police are enhancing their patrols over the Easter weekend across a number of stations in London following both unconnected stabbings on the rail network. Billions of people are being urged to send meter readings to their energy supplier to ensure they don't overpay. The average household energy bill is set to fall to its lowest point in two years from next month after Ofgem lowered its price cap. It's going to drop 12.3% from next Monday, lowering the average yearly bills from £1,900 to just £1,700. It's an average saving of around £20 a month. 
And lastly, the Queen received overwhelming support for His Majesty the King and indeed the Princess of Wales at a special service today, the historic Royal Maundy service. Well wishers brave the cold and wet conditions to catch a glimpse of the Queen as she stood in for her husband. Despite the King's absence due to his health, a personal pre-recorded message from His Majesty was broadcast at Worcester Cathedral and in the video he highlighted the importance of care and kindness in times of need and in the wake of his and the Princess of Wales's cancer diagnoses. That's the news. For the latest stories, do sign up to GB News Alerts, scan the QR code on your screen, or go to gbnews.com slash alerts. Welcome along. Lawless Britain is in full swing. Knife crime is up 5% in England and Wales, up 22%. In London, there were just under 14,000 knife offences recorded in London in the year to September 2023. There were 48,716 knife crime offences recorded in England and Wales. Today, a 19-year-old was arrested on suspicion of attempted murder after an apparent stabbing on a train in broad daylight. The alleged knifeman was able to get off that train and evade police for hours. Also today, a man has been arrested on suspicion of two counts of attempted murder and on suspicion of sexual assault after an alleged random attack at another train station. At no stage did the police release a description of the accused attacker to help keep the public safe. In the North East, there has been a 500% increase in sexual offences since 2014. Stalking and harassment has gone up 6,000%. Now, today, it's emerged that a young man has been rampaging through a town in London since January committing a string of sexual assaults, even against girls as young as 12 years old. And only now have the police released an EFIT image of the suspect. An officer said, we believe the suspect is in his late teens or early 20s and we are working urgently to identify him. Anyone who can help us to do that should contact us immediately. Well, I'm sorry, OK? But he is currently operating in the CCTV capital of England. And the best you can do is a computer-generated image published two months after his first attack. Do you remember Abdulazidi? It was nearly a full 24 hours before the police released images of him. Quite easily identifiable there, the man with half his face burnt off. They even raided a kebab shop in Newcastle before telling us he'd actually jumped off a bridge in London hours after the attack. I mean, it doesn't fill you with confidence, this, does it? And then today it emerged that detectives are hunting heartless thieves who stole a specially converted van used by a terminally ill boy. The crime epidemic is out of control and it is affecting absolutely everyone. Shoplifting is so bad, you have to ask a cashier for detergent. There are security tags on cheese. It's no secret that Theresa May decided to cut 20,000 police officers. That meant that we shut a load of police stations. West Midlands has lost 76% of police stations in the last eight years. The total run by Scotland Yard has halved in the same time frame from 73 to 36, while more than 40% of stations have shut in both Staffordshire and Greater Manchester, leaving them with just 12 each. The best example of the breakdown in law and order is this. A police station in Streatham closed and was turned into a million-pound cannabis farm. There have been cuts, but the police don't help themselves. Outrageous two-tier policing during the Palestine protests. Letting themselves get sexually touched up at a carnival. There we are. I mean, right. Or dancing the Macarena at a gay pride event. There we go. Lovely stuff, isn't it? Fantastic. And that's before we've got started on taking the knee for Black Lives Matter, isn't it? Now, we are struggling to recruit armed police officers in case they end up on trial for murder after they discharge their weapons in the line of duty. So, yes... We do have weak, woke policing at times, but the real problem is actually much bigger than that. The animals have taken over the zoo, and this isn't going to get better anytime soon, is it? Let's get the thoughts of my panel. This evening, I am joined by the star columnist at The Daily Telegraph, Alison Pearson, the founding chairman of Global Britain, Aman Bagal, and the ex-Labour advisor, Matthew Laza. Alison, I look at things like an e-fit image being put out of a man who is believed to be responsible for multiple sex attacks, some of them against children as young as 12, 
that first began in January, and the best our police can do at the moment is just a generic computer-generated image. You think a junior school class could probably do better, don't you? Mm. I think what we're seeing is the lawlessness you spoke about. I think they are emboldened, Patrick, and why wouldn't they be? We're seeing knife attacks on public transport in the afternoon, tea time when children are coming home from school. They're strolling down roads. You see footage of them strolling down roads with longer than kitchen knives, absolutely bold as brass. And the reason they're doing that is because they know that there's not going to be any comeback at all. Just, just something I looked up, which I think is really interesting. So police, British police, give up on four crimes a minute, 6,300 crimes a day. They mm. don't bother investigating. Just... This is really worth listening to, everybody. 2,306,623 crimes in 2023, not investigated, reported, but not investigated. They include 32,000 sex offences, 6,400 rapes, 45,000 robberies, 317,000 cases of criminal damage. Are the public getting money, value for money here? This is unbelievable. If you are... If, of 6,400 women raped, reported mm. the rapes, mm. not one of those investigated. I mean, it's absolutely disgraceful. And they haven't even got the excuse. The government's mm. given them another 20,000 police. There's now 150,000 police. Billions a year. What are they doing? What are Go they on, doing, man. Amand? What are they uh, doing? Look, I think I absolutely echo what you have to say, Alison. Uh, but what I will say is, look, it's not about the money. £25 billion pounds is the budget of the UK, and that's gone up by 31% in cash terms mm. over the last year. So it's not about the money. It is about the operational decisions that I, I would argue that the uh, senior police management is taking in this country. We've seen a bit two-tier policing mm. of these hard-left protests and the Palestinian protests. But look, in the UK, we are proud that policing is done by consent, and that comes through consensus, and that comes through uh, the transparency of powers, but crucially, the integrity of enforcing those powers. Mm. And that's something I think is missing from so many places. You know, you get your phone stolen, you get, you get mugged, you get, uh, have, have a burglary in your house, and it will simply not be investigated to its fullest extent. Mm. And uh, I think it, it boils down to confidence. If people do not have confidence that the police will have their back when the, and when the moment, com moment comes, that is a very well, dangerous inflection It's funny point. you should say that, because actually the latest report by the independent police watchdog showed that the public's confidence in the police was at its lowest ever level, and that was in July last year. Matthew, have the police given up? Well, I think that they uh, certainly is a crisis of confidence in the police. And I think there's a crisis of uh, what you might call neighbourhood police, what they call neighbourhood policing, which is a phrase I actually hate, but i.e. I, what we used to call the bobby on the beat. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that, you know, one of these incidents happened about, you know, three quarters of a mile from where I live in a tube station, which two of my best friends use every day. So, I mean, you know, we, we shouldn't uh, take away from the seriousness of what's gone on, but we should remember that the, that the murder rate in London uh, has been falling uh, for 20 years um, uh, uh, and we need to get it in the context so that we don't frighten ourselves. That's not to say that there clearly are police failings. Knife crime up 22%. Yeah, I think there's a particular crisis on knife crime, mm. um, not just in London, but, but across the country. And I think there is also an issue about a visible police presence. And, yes, we are now back on the officers. The problem was 20,000 officers went under the early days of the Tories under yeah. austerity. They were quite a lot of the senior officers because they're the most expensive, so to cut your budget, you get rid of the more senior ones. They're now recruiting, but, of course, the population's gone up and we still have fewer police officers per capita than we did in 2010 okay, when Labour left power. Only conservative voice on this. So I mean, look, I think, uh, let's be honest, you know, Boris came in as mayor in his first term. Within the first three weeks, we had tens of thousands of knives off the streets for a simple reason stop and search. You know, um, search. that is key stop and search. Yeah, if, and, if, and, if it's and, not being implemented, we're not going to choose any different. 244 knife-related murders, Matthew. I mean, that's... no, I, I look. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not, I think that we've got a crisis of confidence. We're crisis on knife crime, and that's why we need more police officers yeah, on the streets, yeah. on the neighbour, in the neighbourhood, so people know. Spoken, we've spoken a lot about. So you the, can't walk. We've spoken around a lot here. about the police here, Alison. I'm just going to ask you: Are there cultural issues at play here? Do you think? Are we seeing the breakdown? of the nuclear family having some kind of impact? I mean, you know, we're having massive, rapid population growth, potentially different societal norms. Does that have any impact, do you think? Yeah, I, I think it certainly does. We can see from the profile of lots of, of lots of these criminals in London, we can see what communities they're coming from, and I do think there's a bit of um, pussyfooting by the police. Not just that, um, Patrick, but 
a lot of police, I mean, I know some people in the police, fantastic people, particularly the older lot, mm. and they say, well, why would you want to go into this Absolutely. game now when you get your, you know, get your wrist slapped if you sort of you dress a member of the public in the wrong way or say, you know, you look nice, darling. That's, you know, that's them banged up, isn't it? So, yes. so it's a kind, you know, so there's that element of it as well. Who wants to go into policing? Let me just give you one fact, one absolutely crazy fact. Wayne Cousins, when mm. he was, uh, before he was murdering Sarah Everard during that period, he was working from home, right? <laughs> a senior criminal, a detective, a murdered, you know, very, very serious security job. Lots of the police now working from home. As Matthew said, we don't want them so working from home. Yeah. We want them visible on the streets I mean, where people don't feel, uh, not feeling reassured. Uh, well, no. We've gone very quickly. In this uh, look, I think we need a police force, not a police service okay. anymore. Simple. All, all right. Guys, thank you very much. Good start that. Now, look, still to come, Easter weekend is fast approaching in the Christian country that is Great Britain. So what better way to celebrate than with Islamic Ramadan lights on display in central London and, dare I say, it may be in a town or city near you as well. Former Mumford & Sons rock star turned freedom fighter Winston Marshall gives his take on that very shortly. But up next, it's our head-to-head. -head. They protest Queen Camilla at the Maundy service. Are anti-monarchy campaigners, quote, scumbags for still protesting despite the royal family's double cancer diagnosis? Journalist and royal commentator Sarah Robertson jostles with human rights campaigner Peter Tatchell. That's next. It's Patrick Christie's Tonight on GB News. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Serving police officers showing that up to 20% of them are thinking about quitting the force and doing so within the next year or two. What on earth is going wrong? Problem, of course, is that those that go will be the experienced ones to be replaced by inexperienced ones. Kevin Hurley, former detective chief superintendent at the Met Police, joins me from his home in Surrey. Kevin, this figure is shocking. The terms and conditions have really dropped off under Theresa May's, uh, what I would describe as an attack on the police service, where their pay has really dropped off, spending power down about 22% on what it once was. Worse still, the golden handcuffs, which were once the excellent police pension, have been taken away and the pension is now much reduced. The other mm. thing that's killing them is the constant media and activist battering for police officers off the back of that one psychopath and the uh, the other, if you like, Tinder rapist, everybody now thinks the police are kind of all like that. What that means for the individual patrol officers, they're being given stick everywhere. For example, you know, their bosses left, right and centre are rolling over. Oh, yes, we're institutionally racist. What that means for a 25-year-old constable working in Ballam High Street is everyone screaming at him, you're a racist pig. They get surrounded on the streets when they try and do a stop and search on arrest. Add to that the fact that the criminal justice system is collapsing. They're tipping out the prisons with early releases so because, of course, there's no prison space. Cases are taking years to get to court. They're getting derisory offences, sentences, because there's no room in the prisons. All of that's really demoralising for the police. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 
2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's tonight. Coming up, Winston Marshall on the Ramadan lights covering London and, dare I say it, a town or city near you as well this Easter weekend. But first, as they protest Queen Camilla at the Maundy service, should anti-monarchy campaigners stop protesting at royal engagements following the family's double cancer diagnosis? It's time for tonight's Head to Head. Anti-monarchy group Republic were back out on the streets today as they protested the Royal Maundy hosted by the Queen in Worcester. Well, it's less than a year since the same group were causing chaos and being dragged into police vans ahead of the King's coronation. This is the same King who is now bravely battling cancer, meaning he missed today's Royal Monday service and only managed to muster an audio message for the guests in attendance. And, of course, he's not the only member of the Royal Family fighting cancer, is he? In January, I underwent major abdominal surgery in London. And at the time, it was thought that my condition was non-cancerous. The surgery was successful. However, tests after the operation found cancer had been present. So tonight I'm asking, should anti-monarchy campaigners stop protesting at royal engagements following the royal family's double cancer diagnosis? Let me know your thoughts. GBviews at gbnews.com, at gbnews on Twitter. Go and vote in our poll. The results to follow in a few short minutes. But right now, going head to head, our journalist Sarah Robertson, a human rights campaigner, Peter Tatchell. Sarah, I'll start with you. They've been called scumbags, these anti-monarchy protesters. Would you agree with that? Scumbags is a strong term, but I think there's something really ugly about the scenes that we saw today. We saw Queen Camilla going into the service to, to reward 150 good men and women who have done great things for the community. And there was just something very ugly about this braying mob outside. It just didn't reflect well on Britain. And I thought to be attacking uh, an older woman whose husband, the king's going through cancer, whose stepdaughter-in-law, Princess Catherine, is going through cancer, I just thought it just just didn't sit right with me. It, it was a sad reflection on our country that people would think to stoop that low. Yeah, they've stooped low, Peter. Well, Republicans sympathise with King Charles and Princess Kate. We understand the difficulties they're going through. We wish them a full and speedy recovery. The protests are not about them personally. It's about the institution they represent. In a democracy, the positions of state are supposed to be based upon democratic consent based on merit. You know, we have a head of state, a monarchy that is based on inheritance. No matter how bad that person may be, they become our head of state and monarch regardless. That is not a good look in a democracy. We Republicans... Should you to... shout at his wife while he's got well, cancer, though? No. Well, we weren't shout... No, no one was shouting at... Queen Camilla. Down with the crown. No, but they, they Graham, were the head of Republic, made some really disgusting comments a couple of days ago in the press, and he he called... Um, it was really quite cruel, actually, what he said. He said Kate Middleton's cancer diagnosis was just a soap opera. I thought that was really, really unnecessary to, to liken what the princess is going through to a soap opera in a circus. Really? Is that how you expect to get people to come to your cause? Well, look, you By know, using such inflammatory uh, language I'm, I'm like not, that? I'm sure I'm you sure wouldn't like right. it, Peter, I'm if it sure was you going through that and your family heard well, I... monarchists talking to you that way in the street. It, it doesn't sit okay, well. Go on, Peter. Well, let me say, when I had my cancer diagnosis, there were protests against me, and I supported people's right to protest, because in a democracy, the right to protest is sacrosanct, and that includes the right of people who I disagree with. I've defended the Brexit campaigners, their right to protest, even though I disagree with Brexit. Come back to this issue. King Charles and Princess Kate, they are public servants paid by the taxpayer. They choose to put themselves in the public domain. Therefore, they cannot complain if people express opinions. And I think expressing an opinion about the rights or wrongs of the monarchy is perfectly valid in a democracy. But and, and on top of this, 
You know, they are a very privileged, wealthy family. Between them, they have a personal wealth of over two billion pounds. Well, so, that, so that's, yes. all, right. that's all right. That's all right then, is it? You no, know, then he's, he's getting he's getting chemotherapy or she's getting chemotherapy, but they get to go and look at but, the gold. But I think we're losing right? sight of this yet. No one's saying that you can't actually protest. It's having a peaceful protest, and would it not be better mannered? And if you're going to attract people to your cause, is it not better to do it quietly? Mm. Not when the king and the princess of Wales are going through cancer. Can you not just back off in a public way? You could still tweet and and do what you do in private, you know, your followers aren't going to change in that way, but is it not better to do yeah. it at it, a different it, time it, than but, what but they're going through? This is what people always say about protests. Now is not the right time, that's not the right way. I just think we I, have I to said, have some sensibilities about this and think well, that there's two human people here at the centre of this story yeah, yeah, who sure. are going what, through something well, really traumatic. Well, and at the same time, I just want to say this as well in defence of the monarchy. Right now, and I think both of you would agree, this country is going through some of the most turbulent times it's ever experienced. Hmm. The monarchy right now is the one stable thing we have that unifies this country and keeps us together and it also represents us on the world stage stage. Why would you want to disrupt something that has worked well for this country since 1660? For, for 400 years, mm. it's worked well, well it, for it, this it, country. It, Why, when we're going through such a turbulent time, would you want to create it, more it, disruptive it, problems? Yeah, yeah, I don't yeah. understand that, right, Peter. Peter. This that, is not the right, right that, time to be that, doing right, this. That's, that's your opinion. You're entitled to it. But public support for the monarchy is massively declining. No, it's, it's not. not. It is, no, it's it is, not. That's no, not don't true. Don't interrupt me. That's don't not true, me. Peter. It's at speak. 65 I percent. If you, you were to have a referendum now, you'd fail. Okay, You're an extremely speak. rude woman. Let me I'm speak. not a rude you woman. Are. I'm inter saying I'm You're interrupting me. You interrupted me when I didn't interrupt you. Okay. The um. Public opinion polls in support of the monarchy are falling. Among younger people, nearly 40 percent want a democratically elected head of state. That's the way the public opinion is going, and people have a right to express that view. And the idea that the monarchy is this unifying influence is simply no longer true. How Support for Prince Charles himself has massively fallen the princess, in recent years. The Princess of Wales has now been voted the most popular woman in the world. So how has, how has their popularity, how has their status fallen then? When, when people around the world are interested in her story, she's never been so popular as what she is now. So that doesn't, that's not compatible well, with what, what you're saying. What, what people around the world think is irrelevant. We are British people. We have a right to choose our well, head of state. It's not fair. And, 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 but and in the last just... poll, only 15% were in favour. 20% didn't know, and 65% wanted to have a monarchy. As I said to you, Peter, I just don't well, think now is the right that's time. That's only just, not, not even two thirds, even by your own statistic, and I, I dispute that. Well, even it's by your the majority. Own, by your own it's statistic. more than half. Well, we had Brexit before, on less. <laughs> before, support was much higher. But as I say, this is not about them as people. I'm sure they're very nice people Do you think people you're the good person. guys? Do you think it's you're the good the guys lining up, lining up outside a church so that an elderly woman whose husband mm -hmm. and stepdaughter-in-law who are going through cancer can hear you shout at them? Do you feel like a good guy there? Well, Queen Camilla has chosen to be a public figure. So She's paid fine. by the taxpayer. She's a public servant. The public have a right to hold her to account. As I said before, the royal family between them have a personal wealth of over £2 billion. So it's pounds. fine if... Because and, and they're rich. Let, let, this is what I don't get. Me, yeah. what I get. Let, well, that's, that's a very well-spent £1. Let pound. me finish. Oh. Let me finish. Mm. They get, they've got a personal wealth of over £2 billion pounds in the midst of this cost-of-living crisis, and we are still, as public taxpayers, paying for them for their palaces, 23 palaces, over 700 servants. This is obscene when people are struggling with the cost of living King prices. Charles is trying to slim the monarchy down. Now more than ever, we need more of them. He's trying to slim it down, and then we've seen what's happened. He's yeah. going through cancer, the Princess of Wales is going through cancer. Actually, we you need know, more of them, and, not and, less. And of those people who lined up outside that church today, on a Thursday, a working day, I imagine most of those were what, either unemployed or took the day off work? They're not contributing to the economy, are they, Peter? So what have they got to shout about? Well, I'm sure if they took the day off work, they'll make it up uh, later on. Are you sure about that? I'm, I'm pretty certain. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, the, the other thing as well, Queen Camilla going was an absolute massive boost to business in Worcester, and the alternative is what? President Blair... <laughs> Shudders yeah. at the thought. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't have to, look, and also you you wouldn't want President Trump, would you? It no. could be someone like that. Yeah, we I don't, mean, I wouldn't mind him, but you wouldn't want Republicans, him. <laughs> Republicans do not want an executive president like the Americans or the French. We want a low cost, 
purely ceremonial president, like Germany, Ireland, and many other. And who would you oh, want? Who boring. would you want? Who's going to well, come and see I, I us if we have like, that? Uh, Joan Bakewell or Helena Kennedy would be great heads of state. Right. They have a great human rights record. They're much loved and respected across the across the, all spectrums of society. But They'd how old's well Joan Bakewell now? Well, all right. I'm just giving you an example. OK, OK, well, there we go. Look, well, we, you know, we asked for a head-to-head. -head. We got a head-to-head. -head. Thank you very, very much. Who do you agree with should Republican campaigners stop protesting following the royal family's double cancer diagnosis? John on X says, yes, we are a royal nation and anti-royal protesters should be arrested. Gosh. Max says, no, <laughs> you can't pick and choose when protests are appropriate. Elliot says, as long as no-one is advocating violence or disrupting people going about their daily lives, the right to peaceful protest should be absolute, even when protests are in bad Taste. Well, your verdict is now in. 77% of you think that the Republican campaigners should stop protests following the royal family's double cancer diagnosis. 23% of you say that they should not stop protesting. Right, well, there we go. Look, coming up, NHS workers are asked if they are grey romantic or abrosexual in a weird survey, while patient dissatisfaction plummets. So, is the NHS ready fit for purpose? No nonsense, former Tory minister Anne Widdicombe is riled up and ready to go shortly. But next... First, there was Islamic messaging on passenger information boards at King's Cross Station. Now, Ramadan lights, interestingly, go on display in central London, despite Christians celebrating Easter this weekend. Former Mumford & Sons musician turned freedom fighter Winston Marshall is live on that next. Don't miss it. Hello, very good evening to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There will still be some showers around this weekend, but generally through the Easter period, it is going to be a bit drier and a bit warmer than it has been of late. Low pressure still in control like it has been through much of this week, but the flow around the low is going to ease a little bit, so we will see our winds easing. That being said, through the end of today, still quite blustery for many of us, some heavy showery rain affecting northern areas, something a little bit drier and clearer across central parts and also Northern Ireland here under the clear skies could see a touch of frost and perhaps even a few pockets of mist and fog. Elsewhere, where we stick with the cloud and the showery rain, it is going to be a milder start to Good Friday. Otherwise, and as we go through Good Friday itself, yes, a bit of brightness and some dry weather around at first, but still outbreaks of showery rain and a greater chance of catching some showers as we go into the afternoon. Potential for some showers turning heavy, possibly even thundery with some hail. But there should be some bright sunny spells in between the showers and temperatures higher than recently, highs of around 14 Celsius towards the southeast. The winds will be easing and easing further as we go into Saturday, which does look like it will be a calmer and drier day than of late for many. Still some showers around, but they don't look quite as intense as we've seen recently, though potential for some heavy rain to affect parts of Cornwall later on in the day. Easter day itself on Sunday looks mostly dry. There are a few showers still, but turning cooler again by Monday. See you later. Britain's Newsroom, weekday mornings from 9.30. Men's mental health, yeah. men are starting to talk a lot more. Yeah. You've been through a lot of stuff that uh, people don't know about. Yeah, I mean, um, the last few years for me have been very, very difficult. Um, people, don't, people see me on tour, performing, making music, um, but um, myself and my wife, um, you know, we went through... Um, two miscarriages, oh, um, wow. you know, and, you know, for us, that was a very devastating mm. of time and very difficult to, to, to know how to kind of process those emotions. Mm. And I guess as a man, I, I did the thing of bottling up my emotions and where I feel comfortable to, to be able to express myself is in the studio, whereas, you know, she had obviously a different reaction to, you know, what happened to us because not only was it happening to her mentally, psychologically, but it was happening to her physically as well. And I think what something that she really w would wanted to see from me was that sensitivity and that emotion. And I thought that as a man, being strong was trying to bottle up my emotions and just show her that, no, mm. you know, that I'm, I'm being strong for her. Mm. But actually being strong was is talking about it. Mm. And what's happened ever since I've started to talk about it is I've spoken to more men that have experienced baby loss. My wife forced out of me, you know, how do you feel? And I ended up 
as a mess on the floor. I was exasperating, crying, mm-hmm. almost inconsolable. She was just holding me in her arms um, as we cried together, and we cried together. Um, and I didn't realise I needed that release so badly. Like I said, I've been able to speak to other men, and 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 we've been able to cry together. And they've they shared their own experiences, which they did similar to me. But actually. You know, as men, I feel like that conversation and that sensitivity and being able to be mm. emotional together. All right, welcome back. Now, the controversial Ramadan lights on Oxford Street will remain up over Easter, obviously, sparking widespread outrage. Now, it's the second time the Muslim celebration has been marked with lights in London. The lights, which read Happy Ramadan, are funded by the Aziz Foundation, a charity founded by Azif Aziz. But the display marked questions over why an Easter feature was not been put in place ahead of this weekend. Well, that's the latest in a long line of quite controversial Ramadan incidents that we've had, lest we forget, of course, the King's Cross departure board. I'm joined now by former Mumford & Sons musician turned podcaster and freedom fighter, is Winston Marshall. Winston, thank you very, very much. Are we a Christian country? Thanks for having me, Patrick. Yes, we're a Christian country. We've been a Christian country for over 1,400 years. Constantine brought Christianity to the British islands in 597 AD. King Alfred, the founder of our nation, in his doom book, published the Ten Commandments direct from the Bible. That predated the Magna Carta by 300 years. It's the first legal code in Britain. And for 1,400 years, the people of these islands have been marinating in Christians, Christianity, in Christian moral ethic and moral code. We are a Christian nation, absolutely. Now, there is an argument that we might be called a secular nation. Our, our Prime Minister, Rishi Sunak, when he was Chancellor, said that we were a secular nation, even though he'd be celebrating Christmas with a big slap-up meal. Well, and, and to support that argument, the, uh, the, the 2021 census said that we are only 46% Christian, i.e. Christianity is now a minority belief in this country. But I would still argue we are a Christian country. Those, Even those who don't necessarily attend church or don't uh, profess a belief, they are have stewed in Christian mm. morals for a long time. Um, so why does it I... matter, Winston? Can I just ask you, you know, look, why does it matter that we have Happy Ramadan on the busiest shopping street, probably in the UK, I would imagine it is, Oxford Street? Uh, why does it matter that we have things like, even little things, like hot cross buns, which, you know, visible symbol, you know, there's got the cross on it. That's a hot tick bun now, apparently. We can't possibly have that. It, why, does it, why does all of this matter, the, the idea that we've got the Ramadan message on the departure board at, at King's Cross, and miraculously, for want of a better phrase, nobody seems to know where that came from or who did it. You know, why does all of this matter? Well, it's not quite right to conflate it with the King's Cross board, but, and this is because this particular, the, the Oxford Street lights, the Piccadilly Circus, the Lister Square lights, as you said, it's funded by the Asif Aziz Foundation, a Muslim billionaire. Now, what's why it's alarming is that Britain has forgotten that it is a Christian nation. It's actually more like a Michel Welbeck book, like his famous book, Soumission. We're, we're, so, we're, we're just an apathetic nation. We've forgotten that we are Christian. Now, I'll tell you why that's extremely important. It was John Stuart Mill who said that a national identity is based on collective memory. We've been pummeled for so long with diversity as our greatest strength, when in fact it is unity that is our greatest strength. If you don't have a sense of unity, a, sh- a sad sense of nation, and uh, and uh, it has to be a, a, a Christian one in, in that that is what the, 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 we are a Christian nation. If you don't have that, you will have social disunity. It will come apart at the scenes. At the most important day in the Christian calendar, when Christ overcame evil, he descended through heaven and conquered death. If we cannot even, if there's no one who wants to put Easter celebration, Easter lights up in our city. That is a sign of the apathy of a nation, and that is why it is extremely concerning. Do you think that certain people laugh at us when they see that we've got the Ramadan lights down Oxford Street and they see that we've got a variety of different things? I mean, I am aware that it was Pakistan Day, by the way, the other day over the weekend, but, you know, hoisting the Pakistani flag over Westminster Abbey during Lent... Do you think that actually some people are mocking us? Look, with the Pakistan flag, 
that was because every we were celebrating the Commonwealth and Pakistan are a Commonwealth nation. Now, if if we we should be proud about our Commonwealth, it's a great union of nations, and and it was people misunderstood that, misconstrued what that was. There's also the case that we have got a serious Islamist issue in the country, and we have got a lot of dire consequences from the mass migration into the country. Those are serious things. And it's possible mm. that people are laughing at us. But I don't, again, I don't necessarily think that this is an intentional attack on our nation, not to say that there aren't malevolent, malevolent forces who want to see Britain and the West destroyed. But in this particular case, it is apathy. Look at the Church of England. Where are they? Why aren't they putting up uh, lights to celebrate Easter? Where, where it, They're more concerned with uh, virtue signaling, which, by the way, is against... Virtue signaling is an uh, an unchristian virtue. It's the opposite of a, a virtue, rather. Mm. They're more interested in in saying, oh, we need to pay 100 million or a billion pounds to compensate for the, their complicity, complicity in the in the slave trade, for which there is not evidence. So the, where is the Church of England? Mm. Where, how is it that everyone's forgotten what this nation is about? Yeah. Yeah, no, uh, exactly, exactly. Uh, we're not combating it whatsoever, it appears. And, you know, I, I do occasionally like to look into the future, and I don't necessarily always like what I see, but I, I would just like to wish you, Winston, anyway, a very, very happy Easter. All the best to you and your family as well, and uh, I hope to see you very, very soon. That is Winston Marshall there, who is uh, the former Mumford & Sons musician, turn podcaster, and freedom fighter. Right, OK, get your views coming in on this, gbviews at gbnews.com. Well, speaking of Easter, time is running out on your chance to win our spring giveaway. This would be a good present, wouldn't it? So there's a shopping spree, gadgets, £12,345 in cash. Lines close at 5pm tomorrow. Here's all the details you'll need. It's the final week to see how you could win big. I'm Charles. I'm on £18,000 cash. I sent a text through my mobile phone. It was just amazing. As soon as it goes into your bank account, it's fantastic. There's a massive £12,345 in tax-free cash to spend however you like. Along with £500 in shopping vouchers, you'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm tomorrow. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, text GBWIN to 84902. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 double T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm tomorrow. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck. Well, I've got an electric rest of the show coming your way as Angela Rayner refuses to reveal tax advice over her council house sale. Should she follow the standards that she personally set for Boris and resign if she'll be investigated by police? I have got a lot to tell you at 10 o'clock about this, by the way. But next, with public dissatisfaction in the NHS reaching record-breaking highs, should they really be focusing on surveys of staff members' sexualities? And is crime in Britain now totally out of control. Former Prisons Minister Anne Widdicombe isn't holding back tonight. She's up next. This is Patrick Christie's Tonight. We are on GB News. GB News Breakfast. Every day from 6am. He's a genius. We know he's one of the few geniuses in the world. We have Mozart, we have Pat Leonardo mm. da Vinci. He's mm. a genius. Of course he's worth it. Uh, they... worth, worth studying. <clears throat> but, Chris, did they not think that Ben Johnson wrote some of his works? Well, that's interesting, isn't it? Some people say that. There's lots of, there's lots of people out there who, who will question who wrote the plays. What's really important, of course, is the quality of the writing. And I, can I just add, I have some sympathy for my opponent in this debate, because I'm afraid he's going to have to justify something which many people will disagree with. But good luck to him. But I think we all know Shakespeare was well, a genius. I'm sure <laughs> my that's here from Ryan. Well. This is Ryan Mark Parsons, who's a former star of The Apprentice. Tell mm. us more, Ryan. Well, I agree with the other guests. I'm not denying Shakespeare's cultural relevance and significance in history. I mean, I admire Shakespeare. But I guess in terms of his relevance, if you were to define relevance, that, well, the Oxford Dictionary says it's appropriate to the time, context and circumstances. And I think there's an argument to be had about whether Shakespeare is relevant in 2024. 
let's just look at the language that he uses. It's extremely archaic. It's almost elitist because you have to have studied his works in order to understand the plays in which he wrote. So I just want to tear my hair out when you say that. I mean, well, you know, it's true. he survives for 500 years and then the Gen Zers chuck it up the wall. And you say it's not relevant. Oh, he's more relevant than ever because what Shakespeare does tells us about human nature. The human nature in the 16th century, wasn't it, or the 17th century, it was no different from today. You know, if you're looking at Vladimir Putin's headlines today, well, read Julius Caesar. It's just the language can be difficult, but that's good because we need to stretch children. We need to present children with things which challenge them. Don't always make life easier for children. Absolutely. No, make them stretch them a little bit. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria DiPiero, bringing you... PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome to Patrick Christie's Tonight on GB News. Look, still to come, big story this, and it's not going away. Angela Rayner is flat out refusing to share her tax history. Mm hmm But Starmer still says she has his full support. But he's now admitted he's not really looked into it himself. So should she resign if she's reinvestigated by the police? I've got a lot of info for you. That's coming your way at 10pm. But first, it's time for the one and only Anne Whittaker and the NHS. Well, it's crumbling, isn't it? We all know that. But it continues to focus on issues that don't really matter. So, an LGBTQIA plus network sending a survey to NHS workers asking if they are grey romantic, abrosexual, or endosexual. Endosex. So, for the uninitiated, which I imagine is most of the country, Grey romantic describes people who only experience sexual attraction rarely or under certain conditions. Abrosexual describes a sexuality that changes over time, and if you're endosex, your sexual characteristics fit the medical definition of a male and female. OK, but why does any of this matter? The NHS, for what it's worth, didn't sanction this survey, but they did arguably allow a woke culture to infiltrate the health service. Back to the real world, it was revealed earlier this week that public dissatisfaction with the NHS reached a record high. Anne, is Britain's woke NHS still fit for purpose? No, but it hasn't been for a long time, and it isn't just the wokeism, though that has made things worse. The strikes have made things worse. Uh, but the big problem with the NHS, as I said a very, very long time ago, is that it was never designed uh, to cope with what it has to cope with at the moment. Bevan seriously thought that because we had a National Health Service, we'd all get healthier, which we have, but because we would all get healthier, demand would decline. So you've got a service that was set up on the presumption of declining demand, and demand's going towards infinity. Uh, because of the takeoff of medical and surgical science. So even before all the woke rot, even before all the diversity stuff, which is taking precious resources and time uh, from the yeah. NHS, uh, even before all of that, it was doomed to eventually fail. And nobody's had the guts to say what we should do is ask a terribly simple question, Patrick, mm. which is if we're designing this from scratch now, with Bevan's vision, which is that nobody should ever be refused uh, health services because they're too poor to afford it, if we were doing it now, what would we do? And nobody, nobody will get to grips well, with that Well, I'll tell you question. what we do, we do and, 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 it's, and it's pretty obvious, actually. We'd start 
by asking everybody what gender they are. We'd then decide that we had to have a racial quota. Uh, we would have some kind of fanfare out of that. We'd paint the whole thing in the colours of a rainbow. Uh, it would be opened by somebody, you know, who is of a... Uh, definitely of a, you know, particular ethnic persuasion, uh, maybe something else going on as well. And then we'd decide whether or not we wanted to bother to save anybody's lives. And I'm just going to ask you a question here now. I don't expect you to know the answer to this. Amazing if you do, though, to be fair. The Director of Communications and Engagement at the NHS Blood and Transport England Department, they're advertising for a job, right? This is taxpayers' money. Any ideas what their salary might be? Uh, no, tell me. £131,000 a year for a Director of Comms for a subsection of the NHS. I mean, it's up, this is, we're dishing this out. We're dishing this money out all the time. You've got NHS chiefs on half a bar a year, Anne, and they never get hauled before any commission to ask why on earth is public satisfaction with you so low? Well, it's very obvious why public satisfaction is so low. I mean, only a couple of decades ago, people had the confidence that if they fell down in the street, an ambulance would turn up. I mean, now you can wait hours and hours for an ambulance, sometimes even days, and sometimes it doesn't come. And that destroys confidence. People used to go into A&E and get seen immediately if it was serious. Now, that still happens to a certain extent, but it also happens that people can wait for a very long time. Uh, and we know, therefore, that what's happening is people's confidence is declining. I mean, look at GP services. Mm. Um, you know, I come from the times when you could just ring up a GP and he would call, or you could go along to his surgery without booking any appointment. Now, mm. you know, you're lucky if you can see your GP within a fortnight. Yeah. I waited six months for uh, an appointment to see a specialist, and the GP hadn't actually sent over the results of an ultrasound too, so he was just reading it off her screen, which filled me with confidence, but there we go. Anyway, something else that doesn't fill me with too much confidence, and by the way. A man was arrested in London today after two commuters were stabbed at a tube station last night. So this came just hours after footage of a man allegedly stabbing another passenger with a zombie knife circulated again in South London. A 19-year-old suspect has since been arrested. But in East London, a serial sex attacker remains on the loose. Now, this story makes my blood boil. Police hunting this man over at least five sexual assaults which have been occurring since January. The youngest victim is apparently just 12 years old, allegedly. So, Anne, is crime in Britain now spiralling out of control? And when your, your current party now reform, they say, well, I want my country back. Has this got anything to do with it? Yes, it has. When we say we want our country back, you know, we want an NHS which works. We want an education service which is rigorous. Uh, we want a tax system which encourages enterprise, not discourages it. And, of course, uh, we want our country back in terms of we want to feel that it's safe to be out on the streets. We want to see policemen. I mean, how often do you see a policeman? Whenever I'm doing talks, I always begin by saying, right, you know, when did you last see a policeman? Um, yeah. And you know, it is common sense that a visible presence on the streets is a deterrent. No presence at all. Uh, is just a licence to commit crime. No, indeed. And what do you actually blame for this breakdown in law and order? Is it, it, the, There's a, numerous different arguments. You could say, well, there's fewer bobbies on the beat. Obviously, that's got something to do with it, obviously. But there has to be other issues at play here, Anne. You know, there has yeah. to be cultural, societal, familial issues, yeah. it, problems in the home, for example. I, I mean, you know, it, I, I could have gone my entire life having never met a police officer, but I, I'll be honest with you, I've just got no inclination to pick up a knife and use it in anger anyway, right? So it wouldn't have affected me. Maybe that's because I had quite a nice home life. I don't know. What are your views on that, Anne? Well, I think certainly the breakdown of the family plays a tremendous part. So does the breakdown of neighbourhoods and communities. And the idea of, of a general consensus about what is right and what is wrong, um, which certainly in the 50s and 60s you were brought up to know, you know, this is, this is right uh, and that is wrong. That now just doesn't exist. I have talked to people who carry knives. <coughs> I actually did a documentary uh, on um, knife crime and gang crime, uh, and people admitted to using knives, and they admitted it, Patrick, without uh, any compunction mm. at all. And when you ask them why they had done it, it would be something completely trivial.
Yeah, indeed, indeed. And the other thing underpinning all of this is I really do think we need more prisons. You know, we have, uh, I have an astonishing interview, by the way, which uh, is going out tomorrow. So it's a very early tease, this, everybody who's watching at home. But uh, with Robert Jemrick, the former immigration minister, who has been through the numbers, and some of the people in this country who are still avoiding prison have more than 40 convictions and they're still not in prison. And that is absolutely baffling. And, you know, would you build more prisons? Would reform build more prisons? Reform would certainly build more prisons. Reform is committed to building more prisons. Uh, and, and the fact is that when I was in exactly this situation, when I was prisons, prisons minister, and there was a 25% rise in the prison population, and I didn't just put my hands up and say, well, we can't have people in prison. I brought in a prison ship from mm. the United States. Uh, I brought in um, cabins from disused Norwegian oil rigs, put them down in in medium security prisons. There were all manner of things that could be done if you just had the will. What's happening is the will is completely missing. People have given up. And government is very, very complacent. It will okay. churn out statistics and say, oh, look, we're doing something. They're not. No, and look, They're thank not. you very, very much. Anne Whittacombe there. Now, look, coming up, with a record-breaking number of channel crossings in the first three months of this year and the Home Office caught up in another visa balls up for legal migrants, is Rishi Sunak actually taking mass migration seriously? I've got Tory MP Paul Scully going up against former UKIP leader Henry Bolton in tonight's second head-to-head, -head, but next. With Rayner refusing to reveal tax advice over her council house sale, Starmer says that she still has his full support, but... Should she follow the same standards she personally set for Boris Johnson and resign if she's investigated by police? Some quite astonishing video coming your way in just a minute or two. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Hello, very good evening to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There will still be some showers around this weekend, but generally through the Easter period, it is going to be a bit drier and a bit warmer than it has been of late. Low pressure still in control like it has been through much of this week, but the flow around the low is going to ease a little bit, so we will see our winds easing. That being said, through the end of today, still quite blustery for many of us, some heavy showery rain affecting northern areas, something a little bit drier and clearer across central parts and also Northern Ireland here under the clear skies could see a touch of frost and perhaps even a few pockets of mist and fog. Elsewhere, where we stick with the cloud and the showery rain, it is going to be a milder start to Good Friday. Otherwise, and as we go through Good Friday itself, yes, a bit of brightness and some dry weather around at first, but still outbreaks of showery rain and a greater chance of catching some showers as we go into the afternoon. Potential for some showers turning heavy, possibly even thundery with some hail. But there should be some bright sunny spells in between the showers and temperatures higher than recently, highs of around 14 Celsius towards the southeast. The winds will be easing and easing further as we go into Saturday, which does look like it will be a calmer and drier day than of late for many. Still some showers around, but they don't look quite as intense as we've seen recently, though potential for some heavy rain to affect parts of Cornwall later on in the day. Easter day itself on Sunday looks mostly dry. There are a few showers still, but turning cooler again by Monday. See you later. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Want to be a winner just like Phil? Obviously, whoever wins it next is going to be as happy as I was. And they're going to get even more money this time around. So why wouldn't you go in the draw? Enter a massive spring giveaway. There's £12,345 in tax-free cash to give your finances a spring boost. We'll also send you on a shopping spree with £500 worth of vouchers to spend in the store of your choice. You'll also get a garden gadget package. You have to hurry as lines close at 5pm on Friday. For another chance to win the vouchers, the treats and £12,345 in tax-free cash, Text GBWIN to 84902. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB03 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on Friday. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if watching or listening on demand. Good luck.
Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. It's 10 p.m. I'm Patrick Christie's tonight. You show me yours and I'll show you mine. Show us your papers, Angela. This allegation's very serious for the Prime Minister. It's a very simple question. Was she there or not? And if he was there, then his position's untenable. She's called for others to go. Now she's on the chopping block also. Well, I didn't feel that the Prime Minister understood the importance of legal migration to the British public. It turns out Rishi Sunak doesn't care about mass immigration and we've offered to pay the Ministry of Justice costs, so why will they still not tell us how many asylum seekers have committed sex attacks in Britain? Also... I'll tell you what now, I'll invite him on your show now, Patrick. Come up to Ashfield, to one of the old miners' welfares and speak to some real people about their energy bills. Eco-fanatic Dale Vince has hit back at Lee Anderson. Is the fight on? Plus, I'll reveal arguably the worst ever example of men in women's sports. I've got all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages tonight with star columnist at The Telegraph, Alison Pearson, founder of Global Britain, Amon Bagal, and ex-Labour advisor, Matthew Laza. Oh, yes, and what happens next here? Mm. Get ready, Britain, here we go. Labour's House of Cards comes crashing down next. Patrick, thank you and good evening to you. Well, the top story from the GB Newsroom tonight is that the UK's largest water company has been left racing to secure funding after its investors withdrew a £500 million lifeline that was due at the end of this month. It's after Thames Water handed out millions of pounds worth of dividends to shareholders and bonuses to top executives. Now, bosses have admitted their cash crisis could lead to the firm's emergency nationalisation and to plug the major funding gap, shareholders, which include foreign wealth funds from China and Abu Dhabi, want to increase customers' bills, something the regulator has so far pushed back on. Well, the water giant is also facing a backlash from campaigners who said there are mind-boggling quantities of untreated sewage discharging into the Thames, some 72 billion litres just in one year between 2022 and 2023. Government Minister Michael Gove has blamed the government for the firm's problems, calling their failure a disgrace. For years now, uh, we've seen uh, the customers of Thames Water taken advantage of by successive management teams that have been taking out profits and not investing as they should have been. So the answer is not to hit the consumers. The answer is for the management team to look to their own approach and ask themselves why they're in this difficult situation. And of course, the answer is because of serial mismanagement for which they must carry the can. Michael Gove. Now, under 600 Border Force officers at Heathrow Airport are set to go on strike for four days, starting on the 11th of April. In a recent vote, 90% of union members at the UK's busiest airport backed the walkout over new shift pattern changes. The PCS union suggests the changes could see as many as 250 staff forced out of their jobs. They're demanding for the plans to be withdrawn now, calling it unprofessional and even inhumane treatment of staff that they say are critical to national security. 
A man has been arrested in connection with the death of the Gogglebox star George Gilby, who died yesterday after a fall while he was working. Mr Gilby was a self-employed electrician, but best known for appearing in the Channel 4 television series, which takes viewers inside people's homes as they watch TV. He also appeared on Celebrity Big Brother in 2014. Well, Essex police have detained a man in his 40s now on suspicion of gross negligence manslaughter. The British filmmaker Christopher Nolan and his wife, producer Emma Thomas, are both to respectively receive a knighthood and a damehood. Their film Oppenheimer took home the Oscar for Best Picture at this year's Academy Awards. Together, they've created some of Hollywood's most celebrated cinema, including Dunkirk, Inception and a trilogy of Batman films starring Christian Bale. Just lastly, if you're planning to travel this Easter weekend, you may want to set your alarm clock and set off early. The RAC is warning journeys some of the most popular routes could take twice as long as usual, with the bank holiday weekend coinciding with the Easter holidays. Around 14 million journeys are expected over the coming days. That's the news. For the latest stories, sign up to GB News Alerts. Scan the QR code on your screen right now or go to gbnews.com alerts. Come on, Angela Rayner, show us your papers. The Labour Party is in a massive mess over her alleged tax scandal, and it goes away overnight if she publishes her tax advice and makes it public. Sir Keir Starmer, who could himself be forced before the Privileges Committee and even suspended from Parliament over the Gaza ceasefire vote, is absolutely squirming over this. Here he is this morning. She's not broken any rules. She's, in fact, taken legal and tax advice um, which has satisfied her and us and me. Hang on, though. How can it satisfy him? Because here he is telling our political editor, Christopher Hope, just moments later that he hasn't seen her tax affairs for himself. I think she's cleared, but you haven't asked to see the actual evidence to show she is cleared. I don't need to. It's not appropriate for me to see that legal advice. Hmm. So he's deliberately refusing to see the evidence. I mean, the only reason you would do that is if you want to be able to wash your hands of it if it all goes wrong, surely. I mean, he wasn't saying this when a Tory politician was under the cosh from HMRC. And Rayner's now using this bizarre line. She's saying that she'll publish her tax affairs if the Tories publish theirs. Happy if we are going to have a level playing field and we, we suddenly decide that Conservative ministers need to hand over their tax um, affairs. I'm happy to... If you show me yours and I'll show you mine. Well, hang on. The police aren't currently reassessing whether or not to get involved in any Tory tax affairs, are they? As far as we know anyway, Miss Rayner. A bit of deflection doesn't change the fact that there may well be a capital gains issue on a second home and the police may well not have investigated that properly and spoken to key witnesses or indeed seen key evidence. I mean, she can't just keep saying this. Since those allegations were put to me, I got expert advice because I had advice at the time. I don't, I don't have an accountant. I was a home care worker. You know, I didn't have an accountant. I had, as most people would, you put your house on the market, you get a legal conveyancing solicitor and you get an estate agent. But since those allegations were put to me, I got expert tax advice to make sure that I hadn't done anything wrong. Publish it then. Go on. The problem for Angela Rayner is that, A, she would not stand for her own excuses if she was dealing with a Tory, and, B, she has quite a long track record of calling for other people to go. Here she is talking about Boris. You can't ask, answer a simple question of was you at this party at your uh, residence or not during lockdown when people weren't able to see their loved ones who were dying. It's pretty despicable that he's treated the British public with contempt by not answering that question and trying to hide behind uh, Sue Gray's investigation. This allegation's very serious for the Prime Minister. It's a very simple question, was she there or not? And if he was there, then his position's untenable. Treating the public with contempt hiding behind an investigation. Who are we talking about here, Miss Rayner? Well, it's turning into a farce now, isn't it? It's worth noting this, OK? Nobody is asking Angela Rayner to publish 15 years' worth of her own personal tax affairs. She is simply being asked to explain why she remained on the electoral register at an address which she didn't live in for five years, according to her neighbours. It's quite simple. It's also worth noting that the deputy leader of the Labour Party is elected directly by the members, which means that if Angela Rayner goes... And someone like, oh, I don't know, maybe like Zara Sultana, decided to stand, 
Someone who was publicly slammed Keir Starmer over Gaza, someone who really represents the old Corbyn days of the party, well, that could be a big issue, couldn't it? Could this be why Keir Starmer is refusing to say that Angela Rayner should quit if she is investigated by the police? The police do launch a formal investigation. Should she resign, stand back from her job? Well, Chris, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. We've been down this road many, many times before. Um, look, we, the police have made their decision. They need to now get on with the decision and the process that they're going through. So... Is that a yes or a no? Then what's going on there? I'm a bit confused. Angela Rayner has repeatedly spoken about honesty and integrity and called for others to stand down. Are her chickens now coming to their second homes to roost? Let's get the thoughts of my panel this evening, and it's a good one. It's Daily Telegraph columnist Alison Pearson, founding chairman of Global Britain, Aman Bagal, and former Labour Party advisor. It's Matthew Laza. Alison, show us your papers, Angela. I don't think she should resign. She's got a track record of belly aching about everyone and saying everyone's position is untenable. Nadim Zahawi over his tax affairs. Boris, she couldn't leave Boris alone. Look, I think I don't like that playground politics particularly. I think that the issue here is Greater Manchester Police uh, it was brought to their attention this quite serious fina potential financial irregularity and they looked into it or perhaps left it in the intro for seven days and they said no case to answer. Clearly no investigation had taken place at all and now it's been kicked back to them. They haven't interviewed the neighbour who has said that Angela was not living in this house for five years which she then sold and, and or, mm. or which would have been liable for capital gains tax. So I think the issue here is is their favourite in policing? Is this a local Labour MP who's getting a bit, you know, the police are saying, oh, nothing to see, nothing to see here. Yes. So I don't think she should resign, but I think it is, it is potentially very disgraceful and it's extremely uncomfortable for the Labour Party. And I think it could change her image, Patrick. I think that's the worst thing for Labour. She's very popular with working people. If it turns out she's no better than any of the Conservatives who've been mm. fiddling their tax affairs, then, it, then it's going, she's going to take a dent to her popularity. I'm just going to emphasise again, like Angela Rayner, quite clearly, as we did here multiple times there, denies any wrongdoing, etc. The question is, well, can you prove it? And, you know, and maybe she should be able to. And, man, I'll ask you, as Angela Rayner refuses to reveal her tax advice over the council house sale, you know, should she resign? Look, I think uh, it's only fair to say that Angela Rayner is uh, held to account for the same standards she has been demanding of Conservative politicians. I mean, she was asking Boris to resign, not for being found to be guilty of anything, just for being investigated. Let's remember that. But I think the bigger story here is, in fact, the absolute supine jelly that is Keir Starmer for not being able to deal with such a very simple shut and open case. Mm. Look, uh, if you want to be the party of government, then let's have some integrity, let's have some honesty, let's have not the brass neck yep. that they're showing. That's true. I mean, Keir Starmer is deliberately not looking at this himself. He's admitted that. No, well, I mean, look, I don't see why Keir would look at it. My understanding is, is that the... Deputy leader of his party. Yeah, because he, but he's not there to sit in judge or, or jury over her tax affairs. So you, should she resign? Absolutely not at the moment. Um, she hasn't been found guilty of anything. She hasn't been uh, charged with anything. Uh, uh, the police are going to have another look at this. And just like when Keir was investigated <laughs> over so-called Currygate or Beergate, of course, he shouldn't have resigned in the interim. You wait for the investigation, and then if the investigation comes out... What if she's investigated? by the police. Well, so was, so was Keir Starmer over Beergate and, and, and he shouldn't have resigned and nobody's saying that he should have resigned because he was found completely innocent. Mm. So, of course, nobody should resign when they're being investigated. But, uh, you know, obviously, if anything came out of that investigation um, uh, uh, that the, the, the did condemn it, that would be a different story. But I don't think there will be anything. I suspect what's happened here is that Sue Gray, who, who is uh, uh, Keir's chief of staff, who was the he head of ethics for, you know, years and years in the Cabinet Office, has been through this tax advice. And finally, can we just say it's three and a half grand OK, let's just remember that the prime minister's wife was a non-dom in this country uh, uh, for, for years and years and years. And the guy who's the guy who paid. Nothing, nothing wrong with no, there's nothing illegal with that. Nothing but millions of working people were, uh, found that pretty uncomfortable. Did they? Millions of millions yes. of people. Found so, it. Yeah, that's why the Tories are just cracked down on non-doms taking Labour's policy mm. Come because on, Patrick, it's about tax fairness. But Angela's hair extensions must be at least ten grand. Well, who can who can who can <laughs> get paid for out of tax <laughs> income? Not the Labour Party. Allegedly. Well, we hope. Well, look, I think. I think we've heard today that Angela Rayner is already um, in the midst of setting up, uh, the, the, resetting up the office for Deputy Pr Shadow Prime Minister. Mm. So I think there's, there's more to this than, than we can see. 
that you know this is more about well, Keir Starmer, not I mean, having we, the guts. Yeah, no, 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 we need it needs to be properly looked at. We can't. She can't be. She can't be hung out to dry on the basis that one neighbour told Michael Ashcroft, no, who himself was a non-dom for 20 years. It's very difficult, isn't it, for what if that neighbour to get any kind of transparency on this when she's refusing to do anything? Keir Starmer, the Labour leader, is refusing to actually look at it. And Alison, because it's for the police to look and at and it, Alison, Patrick. But Alison, it's... you made you made a point earlier on that you think that maybe we have two-tier policing, not just when it comes to pro-Palestine protests, yeah. but when it comes to left-wingers as yeah. well. Yeah, I do think so. I'm not sure how the beer gate Durham was, yeah. was handled. I think there's still, quite honestly, I still think it was a very bad smell coming off that about who was present and, oh, uh, and... double double standards compared to what Boris, you know, going have a bit of birthday cake and what they were doing, working, you know, yeah. all standing up drinking. Anyway, let's not revisit that. But yeah, mm. uh, you do wonder. I think it was wrong of Greater Manchester Police to have this complaint and to very quickly come back and say no case. I mean, I agree with you that it just seems to be done very quickly. It needs to be investigated you. properly by the police mm. if as an accusation has been made. And let's see what the police say. It's not for Keir to investigate it. It's not for us to investigate it here now. The police are looking at it. And you she's absolutely, fully, you she's absolutely is... don't think that the leader of the Labour Party should at least look at it himself because he is going around saying it satisfied me. And then he was asked, "Well, how's it satisfied?" I think it satisfied his 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 his, his, his team. team because uh, and, uh, and he's, deci he's decided. So you're well, you're running. So you're, if you're running a business, right? And and something goes on underneath. You you don't look at that. If you're only your team goes, oh, that's absolutely kosher. That Matthew, don't worry about it. You just swallow that, do you? You don't carry the can. No, you. I think I think you have the approach. It's, it's called it's called leadership to have the right person to do to it. The, it. The woman who was the head of ethics for a decade at the cabinet office is quite rightly the, the right person to look at it. The other thing is, if for any that's reason, if, again, if, it? if yes, right. If for any reason, if for any reason, right. yeah. uh, Angela wasn't the deputy of the Labour Party. The idea that Zara Sultana okay. would even get on the ballot paper is nonsense. Right. I mean, I hope she carries on. So do you but, feel but it would be a moderate. Suddenly and quickly on this, Emma, do you Very feel reassured simple. that the woman who, who was responsible for the party gate investigation is now, is well, that's, now that's, saying that's, everything's that's okay? The I mean, Sue Gray, I mean, she did 10 years and nobody criticised her for 10 well, years. Well, I mean, let's look at it this way. If you want She's to known be, as a person of great integrity. Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, right. everything has to be above board. OK. All of you, thank you very, very much. I will stress again that Angela Rayner is saying that she's done absolutely nothing wrong and that there is not a current police investigation. They're reassessing certain things. So we await, don't we, with bated breath. Coming up, after we broke an exclusive story on Friday, sorry, on French, spending of UK funds designed to stop the small boats, Dame Andrea Jenkins took the issue directly to the Prime Minister today. But will he listen? Tonight's panel have their say after I bring you tomorrow's front page as they're hot off the press. But first, a record number of small boat arrivals so far this year. 275 visas granted by the Home Office for work in a care home that didn't even exist. Has Rishi Sunak taken his eye off the ball in regards to Britain's borders? Tory MP Paul Scully goes up against former UKIP leader Henry Bolton. That could get fiery. It's next. Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Now, the massive debate back across the pond is NATO. Yeah. Everyone's talking NATO every day. Uh, it was your comments about them not paying enough, not they paying 2%. Pay. And they you said pay. this, you said it again recently. You made a comment, well, the Russians can do whatever they want if these guys don't pay. Well, that's now being that's, used. Yeah, well, they can use it. I don't really care if they use it okay. because what I'm saying is that's a form of negotiation. Uh, why should we guard these, these countries that have a lot of money and the United States was paying for most of NATO? And when I went there, and I already had it out with them, and now they stop paying again. But now they're paying because of those comments that you saw two, three weeks ago. The question was asked by the head of a major country in front of everyone else, 28 countries at the time, including us. They said, so if we don't pay our bills, are you going to protect us from Russia? I said, you mean you're delinquent? You're not paying the bills? Yes. Nope, I'm not going to pay you. We're not going to do it. We're not going to defend you. If you're not paying your bills, we're not going to defend you. It's very simple. And hundreds of billions of dollars came flowing in. Now, if I say, yes, I am, they're not going to pay their bills. Why would they do that? NATO has to treat the U.S. fairly, because if it's not for the United States, NATO literally doesn't even exist. But they took advantage of us, like most countries do. If they start to pay their bills properly, and the club is fair, are places like Poland defended? Will America be there? I believe the United States was paying 90% of NATO, the cost of yep. NATO, could be 100%. Yep. It was the most unfair thing. And don't forget, it's more important to them than it is to us. We have an ocean in between 
some problems. It's more important for them. They were taking advantage, and they did. They took advantage of us okay. on trade, and they took advantage on So if the they military. play fair, if they start to play fair, America's there? Yes, 100 percent, 100 percent. Thank you. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other. Which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Patrick Christie tonight on GB News. Still to come, tonight's panel are primed and ready to get stuck into the very first of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. But first, does Rishi Sunak really care about mass immigration? It's time for a second head-to-head. -head. Yes, well, the Prime Minister's infamous pledge to stop the boats obviously isn't going very well, is it? It's a record-breaking number of arrivals across the Channel in the first three months of this year, and legal immigration isn't going much better. After record-breaking net migration figures last year, we learned this week that the Home Office had granted visas to 275 immigrants to work in a care home that didn't exist. Meanwhile, we've been asking the Ministry of Justice for weeks to provide us with detailed figures on specifics such as how many asylum seekers have committed sexual assaults in Britain. Well, they yet to provide us with this information. I mean, in fact, we actually offered to pay for it ourselves. And still, they said no. Rishi Sunak is now passing the blame for his record as Prime Minister, saying that he was given a hospital pass when he took over from Boris Johnson. So tonight I am asking, does Rishi Sunak actually care about mass immigration? Well, going head-to-head -head on this, our Tory MP, Paul Scully, and former UKIP leader, Henry Bolton. Chaps, thank you very much. Great to have you on the show. Paul, I mean, Robert Jemrick has come out and said that Rishi Sunak only went ahead with a package of immigration measures because he threatened to quit. I mean, does Sunak care? Look, he does care. Uh, he does care about immigration, but there's clearly more of what he can do. So I think that, you know, the premise of your question is, of course he does. It's the more, It was in these five pledges for a reason. It was the bottom one of the five pledges in terms of stopping the boats because it was the hardest one to do, frankly. And so, yes, we are dying at, at, on a hill that is really difficult to uh, to sort out. But what we need to do about it is, first of all, illegal um, immigration, get that Rwanda bill through. It's not a single solution, but it does act as a deterrent. On current projections, if you can actually reduce uh, the people coming out uh, by boats by something like 2%, mm. uh, then the costs of Rwanda are covered. Anyway, in terms of legal migration, clearly we do need some legal, uh, some some migration, but at six hundred and seventy-two thousand, way too high. So mm. tackling the stupid uh, dependencies that we've been doing uh, and, and other measures, these are things that do take time to come into the system and work their way through the system. They do, they do take time. But Henry, I'll throw it over to you. I mean, we have got a former immigration minister saying that he was trying to talk to the prime minister at their fortnightly meetings about immigration, and the Prime Minister was refusing. Yeah, and not just Robert Jenrick, uh, also Suella Bravman, when she was Home Secretary, was trying to have conversations with him about this, uh, so she says, and uh, wasn't able to, to have those conversations, which, to me, shows a distinct lack of engagement from the Prime Minister's point of view. Now, OK, let's, let's be fair, Prime Minister's a busy man, he's got a lot on his plate, 
but this was one of his fly, five pledges, and unless he's totally out of touch with the British people, uh, he should be aware that it's it, it, it's, it might be the number, it might be the fifth on his list, but uh, but it's it's about the highest for the British people. Um, so I think that demonstrates a lack of engagement, and I'm going to disagree slightly. I mean, yeah, there is this this prevalent idea uh, in Parliament uh, being encouraged, I think, by officials and the general bureaucracy mm. that these the measures to deal with immigration take a long time to go through to sort of come through the pipe if you like some of them do things like rwanda most certainly as we've seen do but i've helped 14 countries to rewrite redevelop reform mm. okay. their entire air land and maritime borders to deal with such things as prolific opiate smuggling from Afghanistan into Central Asia, that sort of thing, um, and, and counter-terrorism in the United States. It can be done, and I, it can be okay. done in eight right. months. OK, uh, all right. Pa Paul, I'll, I'll throw it over to you. I mean, is it not fair to say, really, that essentially the Conservative Party has just been addicted to the teat of mass migration and the Treasury, the Treasury won't let you deviate? I don't know. I don't think the governor ha the government has. I mean, you've seen, first of all, going back to the split between legal and I illegal, you've seen a massive spike around Europe on illegal migration and ways we've managed to cut, uh, you know, the, although, as you reported, the high level of uh, numbers at the moment, we have cut some routes from Albania, notably, and those kind of things, whereas in other areas, it's still going up around Italy and the Mediterranean, it's still going up quite considerably. In terms of legal migration, we as a country have been uh, dependent, overly dependent on legal migration for, for a number of years. As I said, we do need some, but there's the default option for a lot of companies and public sector to go internationally to try and find jobs rather than looking at domestic training rather than and then and then finding the skills that we want. All right. Look, I, just, just before training. I go back to Henry Paul, I've got to ask, you know, you say it takes time and things like that. And I'm asking whether or not the prime minister cares. Uh, I mean, with, with respect, you've given up, haven't you? You're not running again. I'm not standing again. Yeah, but, but that's not about migration. I mean, you know, there's, there is a psychodrama in the Tory party, but that's separate from migration, to be honest. Um, so, you know, that's about the next five years. So, but I do care deeply about this for the reasons that Henry says, but I'm also the son of a migrant as well. My dad came over from Burma uh, when he was 18. I've seen the good side of, my, of, of migration, mm -hmm. and that was economic migration there. But, um, mm -hmm. but you can't have uncontrolled, unmanaged uh, immigration. Uh, but you, so you've got to make sure that we lean into that. I do when I, you, you, he, yes, he does care about that. All but right. then when I see he's having a hospital pass from Boris, I disagree with that. We've got to manage expectations and we've got to okay. come up, you know, avoid those kind of really, frankly, unhelpful phrases. Yeah, or, uh, Henry, look, final, final word to you on this. We're going to have to be quite snappy. Can I just ask you, do you think, Henry, that, that the MOJ should be telling the country how many asylum seekers have committed sexual assaults? I think we need to have a national discussion about this. We need to know the facts. There needs to be transparency, absolutely. When I was a police officer, there was a, a 25 years ago, there was a scandal about this. Some chief constables had to resign because they were saying that certain communities had a propensity towards different types of crime. Every community has a propensity towards different types of crime. Um, that's a fact, in, and it varies from town and city to city. Um, but if we cannot acknowledge that, if we can't talk about that, if we can't define the problem, then we can't solve it. We can't define the solution. We've got to have a conversation about it. And if political correctness stops us doing that, political right. correctness is putting the public at risk. Look, both of you, thank you very, very much for uh, giving up at least a chunk of your Thursday night. Either way, I know that our viewers will feel very, very grateful for it. So thank you. All right, now, look, uh, as I've been saying, the Ministry of Justice is refusing to release stats despite us here at GB News offering to cover their costs. They turned down a Freedom of Information request because they said it would cost too much. So we said, that's all right, lads, don't worry about it, we'll pay. And they said, oh, no, it's not really about the money. Well, we will keep fighting for you because you deserve to know, all right? You deserve to know how many asylum seekers have committed sexual offences. It might not be a big problem. It might be a very big problem. But there might be another solution for you which Robert Jamrick will reveal tomorrow night in a TV-exclusive interview right here on my show. Here's a little flavour of what you can expect. Most honest and transparent debate about immigration. I didn't feel that the Prime Minister 
understood the importance of legal migration, it is that we lock up more of these prolific offenders. Yes, we're not giving too much away there, to be fair, but we think that there is a way that you can get that information. It just requires a bit of legwork, which we are prepared to do. Coming up, a women's football team that was nearly 50% trans has stormed to an unsurprising victory against female opposition. How many goals did they manage to score, though? We will bring you the full-time result. And by the way, genuinely, the injury list as well later on. But next, tonight's panel returns are with you through all of tomorrow's newspaper front pages. So I'll see you in a tick. Hello, very good evening to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There will still be some showers around this weekend, but generally through the Easter period, it is going to be a bit drier and a bit warmer than it has been of late. Low pressure still in control like it has been through much of this week, but the flow around the low is going to ease a little bit, so we will see our winds easing. That being said, through the end of today, still quite blustery for many of us, some heavy showery rain affecting northern areas, something a little bit drier and clearer across central parts and also Northern Ireland here under the clear skies could see a touch of frost and perhaps even a few pockets of mist and fog. Elsewhere, where we stick with the cloud and the showery rain, it is going to be a milder start to Good Friday. Otherwise, and as we go through Good Friday itself, yes, a bit of brightness and some dry weather around at first, but still outbreaks of showery rain and a greater chance of catching some showers as we go into the afternoon. Potential for some showers turning heavy, possibly even thundery with some hail. But there should be some bright sunny spells in between the showers and temperatures higher than recently, highs of around 14 Celsius towards the southeast. The winds will be easing and easing further as we go into Saturday, which does look like it will be a calmer and drier day than of late for many. Still some showers around, but they don't look quite as intense as we've seen recently, though potential for some heavy rain to affect parts of Cornwall later on in the day. Easter day itself on Sunday looks mostly dry. There are a few showers still, but turning cooler again by Monday. See you later. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at seven o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panelists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from seven on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, eight till nine on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. OK, welcome back to Patrick Christie tonight. I have got tomorrow's newspaper front pages for you right now. All right, I've got the Independent first. Big picture story there. Angela Rayner, Keir Starmer, uh, they've got Labour's deputy leader refuses to publish private financial details to head off speculation she avoided capital gains tax. Show me yours and I'll show you mine. The Sun now we go to, yes. And uh, there we go. Gogglebox George, death arrest. Yes, we announced that last night. So unfortunately, one of the uh, now former Gogglebox stars has sadly passed away and a colleague at work is held. Let's go to the Telegraph. PM under fire after honour for top donor. Surprise Easter list. Hans Knighthood for businessman who gave £5 million to the party. Uh, the reform is right about Tory party failings, top MP says as well. Um, and a picture of a child uh, sledding. There we go, why not, I suppose. The Daily, uh, sorry, the Daily Express. Disgrace, 
Fat Cat Water Bosses under fire. Fat Cat Water Bosses were branded a disgrace, yes, for failing customers and uh, rising bills by 40%. The Guardian famine is setting in. UN court orders Israel to unblock Gaza aid. And the Mirror save lives for Martin. Report inspired by gig goers' mum set to demand safer venues. So, this is the mother of one of the Manchester Arena bombing victims. Now, uh, apparently there's a new law that she wants to introduce, which, uh, as I understand it, will make uh, venues safer. Uh, let's finish off with the eye. Taxpayers may be forced to bail out Thames Water as customers face 40% hike in bills. So, uh, those of you front pages, look, we'll quickly focus in on the water stuff, actually. Taxpayer faces Thames Water bailout as boss warns of 40% bill rise. Uh, I mean, can this really be, Alison, 40% rise for what? Stuff coming out of my tap? Absolutely not. No way is the taxpayer bailing out these people. Absolutely astonishing, been raking in huge amounts of money and the final insult allowing masses of, you know, sewage to go everywhere. No way. I'm, I can't, can't see no. anyone, anyone is going to put up with this at all. And they, they a sort of, um, you know, sort of fat cat tier of people who've been raking off, paying themselves huge amounts of money, mm -hmm. uh, not, you know, not investing, obviously not investing in the infrastructure. You know, <laughs> no-one's built a reservoir in this country for the, in the year dot. Well, yeah, it? absolutely. I mean, yeah. you know, we, we, we've got absolutely unprecedented rain, wet as February in human history. Yeah. There'll, be te there'll be a you know, hosepipe ban in about... Sort it's of, mad, isn't it's it? It's absolutely yeah. mad. It is mad. And it's because of these people, Patrick. Yeah. They don't do their job, and now it's come crying to the, to the taxpayers. Yeah, I'm, no. I mean, what, what gall and gumption has Mr Gove got after 14 years of Tory government where they haven't done anything to sort this out, now saying that, you know, effectively the unacceptable phase of capitalism? Well, mate, couldn't you have done something before? Well, let's, yeah. let, let's be honest. I mean, I think Keir Starmer said he's not going to renationalise it. We're not going to renationalise it, but, but we're going to come and down on like a ton of bricks. Well, look at it this way. I think I agree with Jacob Rees-Mogg, who said uh, this failing company has to be allowed to fail. Yeah. That mm. is capitalism. We need serious people who want to do business, who mm. want to provide this service for a profit. Well, right. Especially if it's apparently it. going to cost us £14.7 billion. Pounds. Well, yeah, because I think they would have it the debt. It's not unreasonable to say, sorry, we haven't got that kind of cash. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the, biggest, the biggest shareholders in it are, are partly a, a, a Canadian um, public service pension scheme and a university pension scheme here. But they've just been a milky. One of the great things to look is, is to go online and see the, the structure of this company, which is incredible. It's so complicated. It's mm. like a sort of, you know, something uh, you, you just wouldn't make it up. It's like this bit owes this bit owes this bit. Why okay. wouldn't Labour renationalise it? Why wouldn't they? Because it's because because you have to read have to be have to it's an awful lot of money because you have to pay them to renationalise. Well, it. they would if Angela Rayner got in charge, but I guess uh, Angela agrees with Keir. Oh, really? <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. Um, now, our but there's no money left to nationalise. Our bombshell. <laughs> did you go around to Ras and ask her? Uh, our bombshell exclusive <laughs> last night that yeah, revealed was. thousands of British taxpayer pounds is being wasted on erecting a fence in France. Now it sparks a diplomatic row. So I revealed that politicians in the town of Sangat, just outside Calais, I'm fluent, are using <laughs> seventy four thousand euros, hello, equivalent hello. to sixty three grand. All right, of British cash. <laughs> that it's meant to beef up our borders, stop the small boats, right? What it's actually doing, you've built a fence, well done, you, yourself, yes, you have built a <coughs> fence around a French football stadium to stop migrants sleeping in it. Now, Dame Andrea Jenkins, the former education minister, has written to the prime minister demanding answers. In a lengthy letter, she wrote, I am writing with a profound sense of disappointment and outrage, sparked by recent revelations initially brought to light on GB News's Patrick Christie's Tonight Show. This is an insult to hard-working Britons who expect their taxes to be spent more widely. She's basically after a refund and she wants full receipts of where the heck our money to the French is going. French politicians now insist that migrants are hanging around the stadium and leaving waste there. But Dame Andrea signed off by uh, demanding, yeah, that we get a refund. Um, Alison, should we get a refund for the fact that, all right, it might only be £63,000, but we're giving hundreds of millions of pounds to the French and instead of, in some cases, stopping the boats, they're, they're, they're literally putting a fence around an amateur football stadium. Yeah, it's absolutely shocking, and I would, but I would think it was, you know, this is probably going on. I think we've, I think we've paid for an awful lot of croc monsieur for the, uh, <laughs> for the French board, of course. We certainly, we certainly haven't paid for a, a lot of stopping the boats, have we? Really? I think it's. Really... Are we paying for the guy who's been who's been working from home yeah. on sick leave for like four years or something? He's yeah. meant to be I, think, I think we are, but I think it, you know, it it all comes back to this thing as we've talked about, you know, about uh, we've got a prime minister 
who isn't very serious about immigration and all, all this stuff. I mean, I, I support Dame Andrea writing that letter and I hope he pays attention. But quite honestly, I don't think he's interested, really, is he? Look, this is not the first time we've given the French some fencing. We gave them £3 million worth of fencing back in 2014 when we had the NATO... Sorry, the G7 summit here in Wales. But, look, we've given them nearly £700 million yeah. since 2014. We should have stopped giving the French money a long time ago. Look, there's only one solution to the issue we face with uh, the French sending over illegal dinghy wallers, and that is pick everyone up in the middle of the English Channel and not drop them on the Kent coast, but drop them back in Sangat. So you, you, you would turn the boats back? Yes. It's uh -huh. as simple as that. What are the French going to do? Are they going to go to war with us? No, well... We, no. We, we would end up imposing law and order on their behalf for them, because they are simply incapable of doing it. Who's going to do that? The yeah, because the, the Army and I won't do it, the, won't the Royal Navy won't do it. We need political leadership. That's what we need. Well, Leander, can I just uh, say, Leander... Liam Patrick is going to do it. ..was on this show <laughs> last night and uh, said that he would, he would drive them back himself. Um, but, you know, we'll have to wait and see whether or not he means I'm, I'm not sure Lee's uh, a sailor. Nottinghamshire is very... He hasn't got much of a coastline. No, no <laughs> but he's a fast learner. Elsewhere today... <laughs> Hang on, do I not get to say on, uh, on, on Sangat? Can I just say, because we all oh, know yeah. the word Sangat. Oh. Because, because why? Because Sangat, 20 years ago, was a big problem in the market, and Labour did a deal, got the Sangat migrant clamps closed and actually sorted the problem. The Tories... And Dame Andrea is right on this. I don't often say that. Oh. But they're taking the you-know-what because the Prime Minister's letting them. What we need is, is actually holding the French well, to, uh, you know, to what we're paying it's them for. It's another little cheeky tease because I did sit down earlier with Robert Jemrick, uh, former immigration minister. Some absolutely astonishing stuff and um, it's worthwhile noting as well that, of course, Alison uh, did have a chat with him as well about a couple of other bits and bobs earlier in the week. Some really startling revelations coming out now about, I would argue, the, the lack of care when it comes to our borders and, indeed, our government. It makes you wonder why they're clinging on, actually. But elsewhere today... Pro-Palestine protesters took a victory lap after apparently occupying the Departments of Business and Trade to call on the government to stop arming mm. Israel. The word occupying did some heavy lifting, however, as they were swiftly booted out into Whitehall in just six minutes. <laughs> Well, it's worth saying the Department for Business and Trade says that it supports Israel's right to defend itself and <clears> all <throat> export licences are kept under careful and continual review. As for the protest, better luck next time. Coming up, Just Stop Oil protester Phoebe Plummer is back in the headlines again after another privacy-smashing letter delivery. Though what she thought was an MP's home, unsurprisingly, she messed it up. Uh, I'm going to be uh, referencing that in tonight's Greatest Britain and Union Jackass, but next, and uh, this, is, this is a good one, right? <laughs> After Lee Anderson challenged Just Stop Oil donor Dale Vince to a debate, he challenged him on this show last night. We went to Dale Vince. We said, are you up for it? He's responded, OK, and he doesn't sound very happy. Hear what he has to say, but I think the fight is on. And if it does happen, it'll happen right here on this show. And this show is going to go on the road for it. I'll see you in a sec. and Co. Weekdays from 6pm. Um, the Guardian's not happy, any, everybody, because uh, one of their headline stories today was about a private members club uh, that is for gentlemen only, the Garrick Club, I refer to, in London. Uh, there's accusations now, Quinton, that it's all the kind of upper echelons of society, all the, the powerful... It's a cabal elite. of important, powerful people who are running the country. And I thought to myself, <laughs> when I heard descriptions like that, I bet Quentin Letts is somehow involved. <laughs> Are you? I've been, I've been to the Garrick Why a few times. Why can't women be members? Because it's a gents' club. My, my daughter, my, one of my daughters, is a member of an all-women's club called the University Women's Club, and uh, uh, they don't allow blokes in. It's an outrage! No, it's not. It's, it's, it's a free country. I mean, it's archaic and it needs to change. What is? You know, is my view. The fact that the Garrick doesn't admit women members. There are lots of these members clubs, um, you know, across London, probably in other parts of the country as well, and, you know, you have to pay for membership, so it is well to do members of society that go. I've no, no nothing against them existing, but all of them have changed their constitution. Those that were once men only, you know, they all now admit women. The only exception now is the Garrick. My other thought is, well, why are we genuinely, why are we talking about it if we've got nothing more important going on? Just to be frank, I genuinely could not care less uh, if there is a club that I'm not allowed into because of my sex. Um, I do, though, think that if you're going to start... You're allowed in, though. They let them in. Yeah, but not as members. Yeah. 
Um, but I do think if you're going to start, um, you know, having all of this kind of respect and all the rest of it for single sex spaces for men, then you can't, as a society, allow uh, the ridiculousness that goes on in female spaces when a man uh, sticks a dress on and a wig maybe and a bit of lipstick if he's feeling bold uh, and says that he's called Sharon and then wants to be allowed into that space and then those uh, establishments then buckle and let those men actually into things like changing rooms of women. That really, really annoys me. Welcome back to Patrick Christie's Tonight. It's time to return to the liveliest pay-per-view anywhere on the telly. Let's do it. It's the Times. Clean your own mess, Thames Water told. Chinese tech firm seals UK deal. Oh, I'll be honest with you, dull front page of that. The Daily Mail. Rainer on the ropes. Here we are, more likely. <laughs> Council House Gate. She flounders an interview and refuses to publish legal advice. Local authority launches council tax probe and police reconsider the case. So we have spoken a heck of a lot about Angela Rayner tonight. I suspect we might be speaking a bit about it again tomorrow. I'm joined by my press pack. It is the Daily Telegraph columnist Alison Pearson, the founding chairman of Global Britain, Amon Bagal, and former Labour Party advisor Matthew Laza. Now, yes. It's yet again the same story when it comes to biological men competing in women's sports. If you've not seen this, strap yourselves in. This is unreal. Sydney's Flying Bats FC team that includes five transgender players, men, boys, whatever, smashed their opposition team 10-0, <clears throat> with one of the biological men scoring six goals in one game. The team that boasts about being the biggest LGBTQI plus women's and non-binary football club in the world. I think that means they've got the most male players, but there we go. Won every match during the four-week Beryl Ackroyd Cup. Well, to top it all off, the team broke an opposition player's leg in two places. Seriously. I mean... However, concerned female rivals were warned that forfeiting games against the Bats will be a form of discrimination. So... Alison, I mean, how many legs need to be broken before this is brought to a halt, do you think? I know there's a farcical element to this, but I do think a woman is going to die. Right. I do think one of these trans people is going to end up smashing into a female and they will die and then it will all... Then it will become... And people will say, why did we never see this coming? We can see this coming now. It's absolutely shocking. I mean, Aust- I mean, we're mad enough over here. Australia's gone mm. stark staring bonkers, quite frankly. I know some of the parents of some of the girls they were going to be playing against are really angry. They weren't even told about it. But it's just, you know, it, 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 it's absolutely... I, I, I'm, actually, I'm lost for words. I'm just... I'm just you're quite so, upset about this, aren't I you? am really upset about it. Of course you're upset about it, because, you know, we get young women training, competing at the highest level, doing doing their best, and then they bring in five blokes, you know, called Tracy, yeah. and they think that they can just play with them. They, they can't. They buy a lot. The, the advantage that men get go, from going through male puberty can never be erased, however much, or oestrogen mm. or whatever they take or however they dress and so on. So this is disgraceful and it's, it's farcical, but it's also dangerous. Yeah, I mean, it is. It is dangerous. And, uh, you know, the irony in all of this, I suppose, oh man, is that we keep being told, don't we, well, this stuff is OK because there's no real difference between the different genders. And yet, every time this happens, we see the difference between the genders. Exactly. Look, I think it's pretty simple as far as I'm concerned. This is another affront to the very idea of woman, mm. of womanhood, and the rights of women and girls. That's to... why I'm so upset, I think. Exactly. And you know what? I think this is something that is prevalent across the West right now. And I would say the Global South are laughing at us. They're saying, while you're busy with this tomfoolery, mm. look at what China is trying to do. Look at the way economic growth is charging India ahead. Yep. And uh, the West is stuck in... I agree with you completely. Uh, ...affronting women's rights. I, 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 I agree ridiculous. with you completely. They, 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 they must be laughing at us. Look, Matthew, your, your views on this, I mean, you know, I suppose the argument might be that, you know, well, I suppose what, what team... I was going to say, what team are this lot going to play for? I mean, it is the men's team, isn't it? But your, your views on this? Well, I mean, I think it should be up to individual sports to make the decision, um, uh, because uh, clearly different sports should have diff- d- different rules. I mean, I think chess, you know, the, you know, it's, you know yeah. is one thing, whereas rugby is another. So this does seem uncomfortable uh, on first reading. I think, actually, LGBTQ sport has been, a, has been a big success. You know, like, you know, it was a huge breakthrough when you had, uh, uh, you know, gay rugby teams starting to compete... 
uh, uh, in rugby and it changes sport, it changes attitudes uh, generally. But this is a different mm. story and it does seem to me that it may be a bit unfair on a physical level. So sports governing bodies need to get a grip. OK, all right. Now, GB News' very own Lee Anderson is having some net zero beef with Just Stop Oil funder <laughs> and eco-activist Dale Vince. All of this started when Lee posted this video. Watch. Just cut my lawns with this electric lawnmower. It's got batteries on lawn. Look at that. That's net zero at its finest. The trouble is, I've charged this up early on today, and probably the electricity has come from Radcliffe Power Station, just about 10 miles down the road. That runs on gas and sometimes coal. What a load of nonsense that is, net zero. Right then, so Dale Vince hit back. He said, you have no idea what net zero means. Your lawnmower is not an example of that. Britain's grid is nearly 50% renewable now. That's the better measure of what is powering your battery-powered gift. Well, Lee laid down the gauntlet on this show last night with this. Ashfield, speak to, I'll tell you what now, I'll invite him on your show now, Patrick. Come up to Ashfield, to one of the old miners' welfares, and speak to some real people about their energy bills. Right, OK, just quickly then. So if I put together a show that involves yes. you and Dale Vince in yes. Ashfield, you, yes. think, you think you could make that work, yeah? Let's have him up here. Bring some vegans with you as well. So I got in touch with Dale Vince about Lee's proposal. He provided us with the following statement. In order to be able to debate with Lee Anderson on the topic of net zero or any topic, really, Lee would have to do some basic research. How can I have a debate with someone who thinks the energy crisis was caused by renewable energy? That's so far from reality. As to where to have this debate, Anderson doesn't have a constituency. He's a cuckoo in a Tory seat, running scared of a by-election. He might as well come to Stroud to debate with me. That's as much my constituency as Ashfield is, and I'm not elected either. So we're going to go to Lee Anderson, and this time tomorrow <laughs> I will let you know whether or not the Battle Royale will take place, hosted by me, in Stroud. You're welcome. Anyway, there we go. Um, do you think that they should do it, have it out? He said he could bring his vegan. I've been in a working men's club, uh, old miners' welfare in Asheville with Lee. We're going to make this happen, by the way. Seriously, we are. We are. We are. I'm going to. I'm going to. I survive. One day in the next couple of weeks, I, I'll, the GB News viewers will turn their television sets on. I'll be a, in a car park outside a working men's club in Stroud, right, with Lee Anderson and Dale Vince. And so Stroud has quite a tradition. It's a former mining. You know, it's that part of the West Country where they, they mine. It's quite. Um, you know, do you watch that? It's going to be a battle. Look, I, look, I'd be honest with you. I'm a, look, I'm a vegan. I'll go and stand with Lee Anderson. <laughs> 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 Love it. Oh, Can I say, Lee's son is a vegetarian. Yeah, we just, he said it was a, it was a yeah, I mean, it's problem when he came out, wasn't yes, it? it was. um, right, so, uh, oh, there we go. I've got to write a reply on the trans football story. The Sydney Flying Bats Club president, Jennifer Pedden, said, as a club, the Flying Bats FC stands strongly for inclusion and pride ourselves on safe, respectful and fair play. The promotion of a supportive community for LGBTQ plus IA players, <laughs> officials and supporters of the significant physical, social and mental health benefits that participation in sport brings, especially to marginalised members of the LGBTQIA plus community. We are a club that values our cisgender and transgender players equally. Oh. And that is, as they say, that. Now, have you ever been tempted to overtake a slow-moving van? Well, this shocking footage might eliminate any future temptation that you have. This is the moment when an impatient driver nearly caused a head-on collision after attempting to take over a van in front of him on Cuddy House Road in Cowden Beath in Fife on Tuesday. Luckily, the oncoming car swiftly swerved onto the grassy verge. Look. Oh, oh, there he goes. Oh, flipping heck. Avoiding any harm. Yeah, look at this. Is it just comes around the other side of the car? Yeah, grief. Anyway, there we go. Well, it's not revealed today's greatest Britain and Union Jackass. Alison, who's your greatest Britain? It's going to be Robert Jenrick, former immigration minister, who has uh, spoken out uh, saying that Rishi Sunak would not discuss uh, anything to do with legal immigration until Robert Jenrick threatened to resign. Well done, Robert, for sticking up for millions of ordinary people who share his concerns about our broken borders. Mm, OK, go on, man. Oh, it's got to be Lee Anderson. Speaking common sense, <laughs> traditionalist common sense. You're going to get thrown out of the Tories now. 
Go back in Lee. Conservatism. Conservatism. That's the name yes, of the game. Conservatism. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, two strong contenders there. Go on. I'm not going to win. You're not going to say that about mine, which is Gordon Brown for calling for a new anti poverty fund <laughs> to halt the slide into a hungry decade. An imaginative proposal and shows that Gordon's still putting serving his country beyond lining his pockets, unlike uh, last but 1 pm. Well, I am going to go... Uh, well, there it is, yeah. I'm going to go with uh, Robert Jemrick, and I'm just going to remind you again that we do have a, uh, a good sit-down with Mr Jemrick tomorrow on this show. We're going to play you a little promo of that again before the end of this show. But uh, Union Jackass, Alison? Amanda Pritchard, the invisible chief executive of NHS England. The NHS just got its highest dissatisfaction rating since records began. 75% of people now think the NHS is failing them and terrible. And Amanda Pritchard is nowhere okay. to be seen. The government gates gets to take the rap. High time that Amanda come and took her fair share of the blame. OK, go on then, Amanda. It's got to be Angela Rayner for having a howler of a time by not resigning. Oh, right OK. Go on, Matthew. And mine is just stop oil protester Phoebe Plummer, who thought she was really clever. She tried to deliver a letter to Labour's Shadow Health Secretary, West Streeting, at home, and she was boasting about breaking her bail conditions. It was all all over social media. Only, she got not only the wrong address, she didn't even get the right London borough. Classic. I, Total jackass. She was way off the mark, wasn't she? Right, OK, today's Union Jackass is... Amanda... Oh, I thought I was going to win! <laughs> you tease! I, you I, tease! I, I, right, look, I, I promise you, at one point, Matthew, you will win. Right, look, thank you very much, everybody, who's watched this show. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I've thank had a great you. time. It's Headliners next. I will see you tomorrow at 9, and I have got an absolute belter lined up for you tomorrow already, so don't miss it. A brighter outlook with Box Solar. Sponsors of Weather on GB News. Hello, very good evening to you. Welcome to your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. There will still be some showers around this weekend, but generally through the Easter period, it is going to be a bit drier and a bit warmer than it has been of late. Low pressure still in control like it has been through much of this week, but the flow around the low is going to ease a little bit, so we will see our winds easing. That being said, through the end of today, still quite blustery for many of us, some heavy showery rain affecting northern areas, something a little bit drier and clearer across central parts and also Northern Ireland. Here, under the clear skies, could see a touch of frost and perhaps even a few pockets of mist and fog. Elsewhere, where we stick with the cloud and the showery rain, it is going to be a milder start to Good Friday. Otherwise, and as we go through Good Friday itself, yes, a bit of brightness and some dry weather around at first, but still outbreaks of showery rain and a greater chance of catching some showers as we go into the afternoon. Potential for some showers turning heavy, possibly even thundery with some hail. But there should be some bright sunny spells in between the showers and temperatures higher than recently, highs of around 14 Celsius towards the southeast. The winds will be easing and easing further as we go into Saturday, which does look like it will be a calmer and drier day than of late for many. Still some showers around, but they don't look quite as intense as we've seen recently, though potential for some heavy rain to affect parts of Cornwall later on in the day. Easter day itself on Sunday looks mostly dry. There are a few showers still, but turning cooler again by Monday. See you later. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. It's the final week to see how you can.